All right, Josh Smith here. We're live at my Flat 5 studio again. My guest today, I wouldn't say I've known him forever, but we, we kind of knew each other forever. We grew up in the same part of the country, same town. Uh, I remember seeing him play with his rock band, then with his jazz trio at a place called Tobacco Road in Miami. He's one of my favorite musicians on the planet, and I think one of the most important voices we have in guitar and, and jazz guitar especially he's just something really special and i'm really happy to have him here and uh, ask him about the old days in florida and uh, if you don't know him you'll be checking out his music at the end of this i promise but everybody welcome jonathan kreisberg hey josh thanks man thanks so much yeah dude man so obviously we're from the same place we have different backgrounds and we're a couple years different in age and all that but I, I'm, I don't know a lot of your story, and I've been at, starting all these by asking everybody how they ended up with the guitar in their hands for the first time. Mine was kind of a random occurrence. Nobody plays in my family, and my dad just brought it home when I was three years old. It was just like something he wanted maybe to have a musician in the family. How did it end up for you, musical family or no? Well, that's a great, that's a great question, and that's cool to know about you. That's really interesting. Um, I... I uh... I would say I come from an artistic family, but not okay. not a musical family. I mean, not not definitely not my direct family. Like my father was uh, loved music, a huge probably maybe like yours, like a fan of music, but 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 not really uh, wasn't so good at carrying a tune, etc. You know, he was he was when he was younger he he, did, he acted, and he was supposedly a really good actor. But then he ended up becoming an attorney. So it's like you know back then the parents were, you know had grown up in the depression. So a lot of uh, parents from that age, they just, the idea of their son being an actor, that just wasn't going to happen. You know what I mean? So he got kind of pressured out of it. So I think maybe it sounds similar to your thing. Like maybe he was, you know, kind of uh, uh, happy to have someone following that, you know, although it's funny later in life, there was a little moment where I got that kind of, all right, so what are you really going to do? You know, <laughs> Um, and it was right around the time I got a full ride to, to University of Miami. And, it, and then suddenly he was like, oh, maybe this is not such a bad idea. You know, realizing <laughs> he wasn't going to have to pay for college, you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but, but, yeah, so I think, uh, you know, my mom's a painter. So, so there was art in the family. My grandfather played trumpet. And I had, an, I had a gr like a great uncle who was a big band leader. And... Um, the uh, I had a, a, a grandmother who, who played and sang on piano, and uh, and that was uh, you know obviously all influences you know um, just I'm telling someone to stop texting. You know? <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, so so basically, you can hear we're in we're in New York. There's the heat. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that it was for me, it was just something that hearing all that great music growing up, like my dad liked everything from like Coltrane to, to, uh, to Cream to uh, The Who and yeah. some classical music and then like weird, weird, like random Broadway things. And I remember like uh, Zorba the Greek soundtrack. Like, so I was hearing oh, like wow. world music, rock. Yeah, I mean, my, my folks were like New York kind of hippie-ish intellectual type. So they had, their record collection was really cool, you know. And I was born yeah. in New York, and then we grew, we, we moved to Miami when I was like five or something, you know. Mm -hmm. But no And one, we really do have pretty similar backgrounds. I mean, I was born in Connecticut, and we moved down to Florida when my dad took a job. He was absolutely a hippie um, who took a corporate job for the next 20 years because he, He's a really, he was a smart guy and, you know, went into this field that he maybe didn't really have a passion for. And then he got burnt out and opened a restaurant, you know, and this was back in the, in the day. But same thing, the record collection was, you know, from Train to the Allman Brothers to, you know, uh, Otis Redding and Sam Cooke to Hendrix. It was like whatever, you know, just a lot of great music. But, yeah, nobody played. So it was really, yeah, I feel like we have a lot of similarities. Yeah, that is that is similar. And, and yeah, my dad, too, is a really brilliant guy. Uh, um, sounds like the backgrounds are, yeah, definitely more similar than we even knew. It's great. And 
so, but I mean, for me, I think it was, uh, it was definitely hearing Eddie, you know, when I heard Van Halen, I think that was, oh, yeah. you know, it's the reason I picked up a guitar. Let's put it that way. I mean, I already loved music and, and I know I was singing, my dad said I was singing tunes, like, you know, even sing along with box and stuff like that when I was young, you know what I mean? So I was really mm. into melodies, not even knowing that I would be a musician. But then when I, when I heard Eddie playing Eruption, I just went, oh my God, what is that sound? You know, what is that, you know? And, and then I started playing it. And I think it would be years before I'd realize, you know, the connection of everything that I like, which is to me at this age, I still realized that the funny thing is I had already listened to my favorite things like crazy, the Coltrane album. And, mm -hmm. and I would, and years later I'd realize, oh, well, this, you know, that was, I loved that. I listened to that all the time. Then I heard Eddie and then Holdsworth was the guy in between them. You know, he was like the, sure. the bridge, you know, he checked out train and then Eddie wanted to sound like Holdsworth. So it's, it's, you know, yeah. it's that, that, that kind of progression. And of course, you know, that's one side of my playing. I feel like that stuff, you know what I mean? Cause it's not everything. Cause I'm also into really, you know, simple melodic playing too. I like both, yeah. you know, so that came from miles and, and, and things in you know, Ray Charles and all the other stuff that, that I probably heard as a kid. But yeah, when I picked up the guitar, it was that, I just heard that thing and I said, whoa, what is the sound, you know? And it's interesting out that at that age, I feel like there's certain influences that set us up and kind of set the stage for where we're gonna go in a lot of ways. Um, even though we're young, we don't realize that's happening. And, and I remember, you know, just maybe not consciously making this decision, but realizing like my, like my dad brought me a West record and I love West. West is great. At the time though, I, I almost knew in my head, like I was like, all right, I love this Coltrane. I love this miles. You know, I even love this Brubeck, this other odd time stuff. I was already like into that sound and I love Eddie Van Halen. And I love Clapton and I love Hendrix and I love, and you know, but, but I, I, I didn't necessarily want to play guitar like Wes, if that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Like I kind of knew that already, you know, and I think maybe that's something that's a little different for me as a jazz player. A lot of jazz players grow up. The first thing they check out is a lot of Wes or one of the classic yeah. jazz guys. I was listening to jazz horns and piano players. That was what I was into not even knowing yet that I could even play that on the guitar. Like I hadn't figured that out yet. That would be years later, you know, or mm. years, whatever, maybe two years later, you know? Um, but, uh, but I think in a way I already kind of, if I look at my early tastes, I already have my concept laid out. Like, it's like, <laughs> I like, I like guitar and I like this universe, this, this universe of guitar and this sound and all the, the, the feeling and emotions and colors we can get out of the instrument. But harmonically and melodically, I really liked what a lot of jazz horn players and piano players were doing and some and classical music. So if I think about what I'm doing today, it's that. That's it. It's those things. Yeah, that that makes like. sense. Yeah, I hear yeah. that. Yeah, it totally yeah. makes sense. It's weird. It's, well, it's weird. Uh, you know, so your dad brought you that West record. Did he not have a lot of other jazz guitar in his record collection? Because no. I'm, I'm realizing that I, I didn't hear Wes or Kenny Burrell or, you know, Jim Hall or, or anybody really until much later. Like I heard Monk and Train and Miles and, you know, Freddie Hubbard even my dad had, but no, he didn't have any Wes records or anything yeah. like that. Yeah, exactly. No, we're, we're, our background keeps getting more and more similar. No, it was, it was exactly the same. It was the same. My dad, you know, because probably both of our dads, you know, they knew – the stuff that was, although Wes was popular, but I, I, yeah. probably both our dads were a little more, like Wes was almost like a little more in, in the, you know, he was, when he got popular, it was like playing with strings. It was a little kind of corny, almost some of the yeah. arrangements and stuff, you know? Um, although if he, he plays beautiful, even on that, of course. But, uh, but no, I, I think, <laughs> did your dad smoke weed? I think he did in, in the sixties. I don't know. You know, he right. didn't when I was born, I don't think. Not that I know. I mean, I never. I think my dad probably literally did when I was born, actually. But, uh, <laughs> but but I guess my point is, you know, them coming more from the hippie side, yeah. you know, 
that's going to bring them to train miles Monk. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that makes sense. You know what I mean? So I, Yeah, I he didn't have an extensive – it was like the greatest hits. He had giant steps and favorite things. He had kind of blue. You know Same. what I mean? He had round midnight. It was like – that was that's what he good. had, you know? You yeah. just crack, you're cracking me up right now, man. That's yeah. literally the exact albums my dad had. That's yeah. the that's the ones that's the ones it was re- and, and it's round about midnight right the album yep. yeah yeah the, yeah yeah exactly round about yeah. midnight my favorite things giant steps uh and then I can't remember I can't Kinda remember Blue, which Freddie course. Hubbard record he had I know he had a Freddie Hubbard record and I can't remember which one it was yeah I bet I know which one probably one of the the CTI ones I bet I th- but, I think it was a CTI one yeah 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 yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, it's, you know, and then, and then he had uh, Take Five from Brubeck, which was a big okay. hit when he was even younger. And that's 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 a really cool record. So, yeah, no, those were ones that it's crazy how that, that stuff sticks with yeah. you. you know? Dude, so, okay, so you hear Eddie and you want to play guitar. Do you just convince your parents to buy you one? What's the move? Yeah, so that's so, so I have kind of, yeah, basically I just begged for a guitar and there's I got a, a Vantage, which was like this, you know, I don't know if you remember those. I um, remember Vantage, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It was a pretty guitar. I still have a picture of me of getting it on Christmas somewhere. It's, it's, um, I think that was the same year I got Back in Black on vinyl. Oh, you know, my nice. first, you know, which was, of course, nice, shiny black present, you know. Um, but... Uh, I think what happened was the first year I played, I was, you know, doing all the kind of, you know, hot cross buns, da, da, doing these, all these, yeah, you know, out of Mel Bay book and all that stuff. Yeah. And I, I think I wasn't a great student at first. Like I, I had pretty good ears, so I would learn the stuff usually like listening to him and then, and I kind of know, or I know it, or they were like songs we knew. And then he was like, I'd act like I was reading it the next week when I went back. And he actually caught on to me. And, and it's a funny story where the, the teacher actually, like, you know, what, like, distracted me and he changed the page or something. Like, and then I looked at the page and acted like I was reading it, but it was a, not the thing I was playing. So he basically busted me for not sight reading. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know? Yeah, sure. Um, and, and, then, and then at some point, you know, I was, like, playing tunes, like, but I, I wasn't doing any of my work. Like I wasn't practicing. So I wasn't like immediately a great student. That's for sure. And, uh, I remember my mom took my lessons away. She was like, yeah, you're not going to do it. That's it. You know, I'm not going to pay for this, you know? So, you know, I did the whole kid thing probably. And it's, oh, pff, you know, then forget right. it. I'm not going to do it, you know? And then I feel like it was just kind of looking at me and I started actually doing more, uh, um, learning things by ear more and just and kind of like just noodling a lot, you know, and I kind of started to develop, you know, I, I guess my own relationship with the, the, with the guitar, which I, I, I look back on now. And I think it was cool. It was good that I did that because, mm-hmm. you know, hearing that you had the guitar around really young, you, you probably automatically had that because there was a guitar around when you were four or five years old, like you're saying, you know, that's crazy. Yeah. Um, so that was my chance to do that, you know, just to kind of greet the instrument without a teacher telling me how everything works and just kind of, so it was cool. I came back, you know, maybe five months later or something like that. And I said, all right, I want lessons again. You know what I mean? And this time I went and I just started asking questions, you know, I was really like, I knew what I wanted to to do. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I I wasn't that young at that point. I was probably, I got the guitar when I was like nine or 10. So it's like Mm -hmm. probably, 11 at that point or something at 12 you know yeah and we didn't get that still didn't get that serious the serious thing happened for me around 14 or something when i got really really serious really fast i mean practicing 10 hours a day kind of thing you know right did you have um friends your age who played or anything like that i because I, I, I never had guys it was always like uh you know it was all sports, all my friends. I didn't have musician friends. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I had some good ones, and I'm still in contact with them, you know. Wow, that's cool. Yeah, yeah, a couple of them, for sure. Yeah. And what about, uh, did you play music at school at all, like when you got to high school? Yeah, so, you know, I I know that uh, when I went, by the time I got to high school, I was I was also playing classical pretty good and and I was playing you know I started getting more studious in general so I was playing classical uh, beginning to learn about 
the theory that would lead me to jazz. I wasn't playing jazz yet. It was still like I listened to it and I appreciated it, but I didn't picture it on the guitar. I still hadn't transcribed mm -hmm. a horn solo on the guitar at that point. Um, I had, you know, I had teachers that recognized that I had good ears and I was worked hard. So I, had, I remember I had one that told me, you know, go home and, uh, you know, uh, don't come back to, you know, the solo at a crossroads, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> Nice. So I was home, you know, you know, going, you know, figuring it out and going back and, you know, th that kind of, which I, I really appreciate those teachers, you know what I mean? Because any teacher can show you scales, but a teacher that kind of gets you to really start using your ear, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but uh, I feel like in the high school I was at, I was at a, a Killian, you know, public school in Miami. And... The teacher was like a, she was like a classical bass player, you know what I mean? So it's like, at one point she was like, Jonathan, how do I play this thing? <laughs> and that was when I was like, oh man, I think, you know, because I had a, a drummer friend of mine who had already gone to New World, the arts high school. And he uh -huh. was like, dude, you have to come here. Like, what are you doing? You know what I mean? So I went pretty late. I went my senior year. And, but uh -huh. um, because I wasn't really, you know, in high school, I mean, I shedded like crazy. But by the time I was in high school, I was playing like, you know, note for note, Steve Vai solos and stuff like that. And, and, mm. and playing Bach classical stuff. And, you know, I, I could play at that point, it's just the information. Um, I also, I, I was pretty obsessive about theory. So I was pretty good with theory already. You know, I think I even went, I went to a, a, a junior college for theory classes at that point, even when I was in 10th grade or something like that, you know, so I was always interested in counterpoint and classical type theory and stuff. So I, I was doing that already. My friend was like, what are you doing? Like, come to the school. Like, it's great here, you know. And I guess they don't normally bring people in as seniors, but I, I somehow got through the cracks. And that was it. That was the big change, you know, because there was a teacher there named J.B. Dias, who was a great uh, jazz teacher, getting guys, you know, especially there, just kind of raw and, and, and get them kind of, hooked up with what they need to do. And right. for me, that was like the live wire, you know, thing that just set, set me off. I was really hungry for jazz at that point. You know? I realized wow, so it, was, well, it wasn't yeah. really till your senior year then of high school. That's, that's when I really, yeah, bebopped out. You know what I mean? Before yeah. that, it was like, you know, I theory, classical and, and rock, you know, you know, of course, all my rock situations or whatever you want to call it at that point, fusion -y or prog or whatever the things I was doing. I mean, it was all about improvisation. You know, that was I just sure. wanted to improvise all the time. I mean, I liked writing tunes and I still like writing music. I mean, composition is a huge part of what I do. And I was composing at that point. You know, I, I had bands that was writing pretty interesting music. Um, but I just was always improvising, you know, and yeah. usually too long and too loud. <laughs> you know? But, uh, but uh, you know, that's when I think I realized is, is I love jazz. I like improvising. I like all these other colors. How can I bring that in there? And at that point, you know, senior in high school, I just, I knew that could happen later, but I was really starting to focus more on bebop for, for that, that year or so, you know. Mm -hmm. And did you ever get together with any of like the Miami teacher guys? Who was the dude, the older guy who was like Mr. Bebop in Miami? I, I'm, I'm, I'm drawing a blank, but so many of my friends went down there for a lesson and I can't, I can't think of his name now off the top right. of my head. The guys that were like, I mean, I didn't because I, I kind of, I had like guys that were good, like, kind of like rock and folk guys that taught me a lot of theory. I had a good classical teacher, you know, and as far as jazz, like I said, I hadn't really, yeah, I hadn't studied jazz until, and then by the time I was a senior, JB really was like my guy. He was like my guru mm -hmm. that year. So, and I went straight from there into University of Miami with um, Randall Dallon. But yeah. the guy you might be talking about, maybe Simon Sauls, is that? No, that's not it. I, it was like an old school guy and like the old adults I were playing with, they would always talk about him. He was like 80 back then. And he, he had like a little book that he had written that was like Xerox and he stapled it. And now you would get this book from him. 
and I remember seeing it. I can't, man, it's, it'll come to me. I can't, yeah, he was yeah. like part of like the that older scene, like Ira Sullivan and those guys. And you know, right, I can't think right. of who it was. Yeah, if yeah. you told me the name, I'd probably remember him. But yeah, yeah. But, yeah like no, I remember I Randy Burnson told me about him. Probably, you know right, what I mean? Right. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I studied with a couple of the kind of grads, grad assistant guys that were around UM at that time. Uh, but even before I went to school and they were great. Actually, I'm still in touch with all them too. Like Lindsey Blair was down there and Tom Lippincott. Um, oh, Tom, yeah. Yeah. I know him. Yeah. Brian Monroney. I mean, I probably took one or two lessons with some of those guys, but, um, you know, they kind of, you know, pump, pump my head big by saying, Oh, I couldn't teach you anything. You were already killing, you know, but I, I don't buy it. You know, I, I'm sure I was just a sponge just taking in whatever I could from everybody, you know? Man, well, so yeah, you're you're in a town with a, that has a great jazz school, and so you say you get a free uh, full ride to UM. So your parents start to back off, and 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 they realize maybe this is a good a good idea, and that you've got what it takes. Uh, but you mentioned a little bit you were playing in bands a little bit, playing prog and writing tunes. When did that start? And do you remember like your first paid gig? Oh yeah, well I was gigging really early. Um, you pro I mean, you were too, I'm sure. I mean, yeah. I know, I, yeah, I know you were. Um, yeah. I was, I think my first, that's, that's something that I wonder if kids today have these, uh, these opportunities, you know, there's just so many gigs. I mean, weird gigs. I yep. mean, I was probably working when I was 14, I think was when I first started working gigs, you know? Um, and some of them were great and some of them were just completely awful you know it's like i think yeah maybe even earlier like as far as like a backyard party rock band gig i probably did when i was 13 even or something mm -hmm. you know? um yeah. uh but yeah 14 or so i started doing some gigs like i remember i had this one gig with this guy who worked at i was also teaching pretty young i started teaching um you know privately around that age too the guys who just wanted to learn theory and rock stuff because I started to, you know, have enough that I could teach other people the stuff I was learning, basically, you know, I always right. enjoyed teaching. Um, but no, so I think this was a guy, I'm trying to remember if I knew him. No, I wasn't teaching at that store yet. That's, that's incorrect. It, it's, I was actually a student at that store and he was someone who heard me and he probably thought, oh, this kid's good. And, you know, I can pay him less than I can pay an adult or something like that. But uh, he was, it was funny, man. In hindsight, it was like, it, you could almost could have been damaging because he played every song with completely wrong changes. He would just make up his own changes that would fit the melodies. He would sing the melodies right, and he would play one of those organs with like the little fake drum machine on it. Okay, you know? yeah. And it was like these little gigs, and sometimes he would scratch out these changes, or a lot of times I'd have to learn it by ear. And I just think it was great to play gigs like that, where you're learning on the spot, basically. That's the kind of thing that I think yeah. a lot of people don't get today, you know. Because, you know, he was, one of people guys, yeah. Yeah, he was one of those guys that, like, he would say he knew the tune because he wanted to get the tip, you know? So he would just, yeah, yeah, I know it. And then he would, he would know the melody, and then he'd just make up these chords. And it was like, they would never be right. <laughs> so I'd be, like, learning the wrong chords. Well, you know, it's like, probably, like, some of it was, like, more challenging than, the, the, than you know, learning the real chords, you know? Yeah. Yeah, but those kind of get I mean... You're right. Guys are missing out on that. I get the question a lot from like younger guys. Hey, where's all that stamina and vocabulary? And how do you build these long solos that are fucking eight minutes long? Like, where's that come from? And it's like, well, dude, thousands of gigs. That's where it comes from. Like, gotcha. especially hundreds of them as a child where I was forced to solo for three hours a night, three sets, right. you know, like that. the guys don't get that chance anymore. Yeah. I mean, that, that was... I, I have to say, yeah, even some of those gigs that, like, at the time, maybe had certain elements that were dra a drag, it's, it was a good time, man. It was a good time, you know. Yeah. Um, and it's also, it's just nice to play gigs. When you're at that age, you just don't care that much, you know what I mean? You're just playing, you know what I mean? As you get older, there's a lot of other things that are coming to play. It's yep. great to keep in touch with that, that inner child, you know. Yeah, there wasn't real. I mean... I knew the better gigs from the bad gigs, but there really wasn't a bad gig for me as a kid. Then it was yeah. like, this is, you're going to put money in my pocket and I'm playing guitar and I'm going to walk oh, yeah. away probably better than yeah. I did the day before. It was all gravy. Like I loved every oh, yeah. minute. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I'd be playing a song over like Sade's Sweetest Taboo or something. And I'd be like, this is, I'm going to tell a story on this. It's going to be like yeah. a whole other vibe, you know? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and yeah. That would last, you know? Absolutely. All right. So you get to college and, you know, that's probably a great environment because you're, you're around so many like-minded people and you're, you're learning a ton of new stuff and all that. Um, when, when you knew that was wrapping up or whatever, maybe it was already while you were in college and you started working more, did you have to then even have the conversation with your parents about like, you know, what, no, what you're going to do I when never, you graduate? No, I never had it again after that time in okay. my senior year or whatever when, when I had that with my dad. I mean, I just, yeah. Uh, I was, yeah, I mean, it's probably like you, we both had a lot of things happening for us at that age. So yeah. I don't think there was ever any question. I think once... I mean, maybe it was with you. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it was the same. I think they probably saw us at that point on stage and realized, like, wow, this is this is what this guy's going to do for the rest of his life. I'm not going to talk to him about anything else, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I mean that that happened. Yeah. I mean, around that time, I think that yeah that that I knew I wanted to be a musician from even younger. Like you know yeah sure. like I said, 14. I think it was when I was did some kind of little gig and after my mom said i said this this there's no question this is what i'm gonna do for the rest of my life you know what i mean it was yep. more the, the the financial talk with my dad that happened after but sure but um i should have listened to him no. <laughs> <laughs> well did i mean did you think you know at that point like when you were getting ready to graduate or whatever did you think okay what i, I want to play jazz for sure i want to be my own solo artist i just want to be a guitar player that pays the bills like did you know kind of where you wanted to be yet yeah that's a great question um i was always stubborn as hell you know that's for sure so like i think i knew at that point i was going to be a leader or something because i was not sideman thing wasn't so much in my personality you know what i mean i just i just like to do what i wanted to do with the music mm -hmm. you know um you know, for better or for worse, that was just what attracted me to music was creating a universe. You know, as a jazz musician, of course, later I would want to do that with other musicians. You know, right. it's not like a like I was in, in a box or something. But I definitely didn't see myself like saying, you know, you know, in Florida we would get these like pop gig offers, a lot of pop bands out of there. Yeah. So I, I pondered that. I got calls for like the you know Miami Sound Machine thing, and, and you know, and, and there was rock bands that that, that wanted to do something. And, you know, uh, I just think I knew at that point I wanted to do creative music, and I did have that. You know, at that time I was playing. By the time I finished school, I had like two lives going on. I had one that was jazz and one with it was this prog rock group i had called third wish which yeah i was, remember third wish yeah. yeah we had a blast i mean we opened for Vi, we opened for mom's theme we did all these really fun tours and stuff and uh well not not like not national tours but we we were, we were around florida you know um yeah but i also had my trio that was starting to do more and more stuff um and that started touring up and down the coast um so those two things were were op occupying a lot of what I was doing, um, and I just think, yeah, it was never a question. It was like I liked that stuff so much that I never thought of doing anything else, you know, in the music world. I knew it was going to be creative. I knew it was going to have improvisation and composition involved, you know. What I didn't bargain for maybe was New York. You know what I mean? Like what, how I would change when I came to New York. Because it did change me, you know, like it does everybody, you know. Um, yeah, well, that's it's very interesting to me, the whole New York thing, because, you know, as much as I love jazz, I'm not a jazz guitar player. And I do remember distinctly, like at some point, like uh, how far do I make it not the decision, but like like realizing, OK, do I go all the way down this jazz rabbit hole or do I stay where I'm at, you know, and, and do like this thing that I've found that's already kind of my thing. And, and then so many guys here yeah, do what you did, make the whatever the pilgrimage, I guess, to New York. How, how did you, you know, come upon the decision to actually do it? Like what was what pushed pushed you over the edge to make the move? Yeah. So that trio, we were. We were touring up, you know, I think Third Wish at that point, it kind of, I don't really, really remember 
if that was going on up until when I moved to New York. I don't think it was. I think at that point, the trio had kind of taken center stage of what I was doing. But maybe they were at the same time. It's really, I actually don't remember. <laughs> but, uh, but I know that, w- that with the trio, we were touring a lot. And, and we went to New York three or four times. And one of the times, I think I went to Smalls or someplace. And I heard people that I'd later play with, like Joel Fromm and Ari Honig and Joe Martin and guys like that. And I just... I just said, we also, we did, a, we did a show with Kurt Rosenwinkel too around that time, like a, a double bill. Was, uh, so, you know, I heard all the stuff that was happening up there and I was like, oh, I gotta go, I gotta go, you know? And basically yeah. I told the band like, let's go up there, you know? And I, I knew they, they might not because they were more connected they, here in, in Miami. And I don't know if they really wanted to do that thing, which is, you know, it's a sacrifice, you know? It's not yeah. easy to live in New York. So, uh, I, I went on my own with my girlfriend at the time, got in the van and drove up to New York and moved there. And uh, I think, I don't know if it's a chicken or the egg situation because I think I was also itching to go deeper in, you know, the, the danger with, with fusion and Prague ideas is that you go into this idea of the future and of all the possibilities. But music is a timeline, you know, for me, it's always, what, I, what I've realized is that you, you need to kind of go back as far as you go forward. You know what I mean? If you, re, if you really want to make the deepest music possible, you know, if you think about anyone, whether it's Keith Jarrett or Coltrane or Stevie Ray or whoever it is, they go back as far as they go forward. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure if you ask Stevie Ray to play pretty much any blues cat, he could probably mimic going back to Robert Johnson, maybe even earlier for all I know. You know what I mean? Yep. Yeah. And it's the same way with Coltrane. It's the same way with Keith Jarrett, you know. And it probably was the same way with J.S. Bach, you know what I mean? It's like, probably, it's just yeah. a way of, of thinking about the music, you know. And I had, I was young and I had learned, you know, what I considered at that point enough about jazz and harmony to just be myself. But, you know, I already knew it in the back of my mind and moving to New York was like a, you know, a B-slap, you know. It was like, oh, Actually, there's a lot more I've got, <laughs> I've got to learn, you know. So I, I, you know, I just got rid of all the gear and I started showing up with my little Princeton and my guitar. I plugged straight in and I spent, you know, a lot of people say, oh, why, why was there so much time But after this Jonathan Kreisberg Trio album I did in Miami and the next mm-hmm. album I did, which would be trioing, um, uh, I think just four or five years. And mm-hmm. basically I was just you know, showing up with the Princeton and the guitar and learning hundreds of standards, studying Sonny Stitt, Tristano, Bird, all the masters, just going yeah. much deeper into harmony and melody than I, you know, instead of reaching out, I was reaching in, you know. Yeah. Uh, it was a great thing for me. I mean, I, I definitely wouldn't be who I am if I hadn't done that. I'd be something else. It might be cool, you know. I'd definitely be more of a fusion player because there was that... Right. Even when I moved to New York, there was a little bit of that promise that I might be the next, like, fusion guy, you know what I mean? Because that first record has so much of that. Right, and yeah. I think even, like, Jeff Andrews, who was playing with Mike Stern at the time, he's passed away, unfortunately, but he, he, uh, he like, had played with me in Florida and really liked my playing and was going to hook me up with a lot of people. I think he was kind of pissed that when I moved to New York, I stopped playing the Strat and I just started playing this and, you know, but it's, yeah. you know, it's just, it was just what I had to do at that time um, to let everything kind of gestate and come back together, which it did, I think, at some point, you know, after that yeah. period, it started to kind of become one thing, you know, and for me, did to you, be it was deeper, you know, at that point. You know? Well, yeah, I mean, it was like you built it, you know you already had done so much work and then you built even more foundation. So then now you, be, you know, it was like, yeah, I felt like I remember hearing the record you just mentioned after your first trio record and thinking, wow, this is a different guitar player. You know, like you went, you went away to New York. And I, I, I remember wondering, did they issue you a 175 when you crossed the city limits? You know what I mean? Cause I was like, where's the strat? <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, believe it or not, the 175 I actually had in Miami. I, I figured you did. I just didn't remember yeah. it, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, I would bring it to. I would play, bring it to the gig, and you'd play it for one or two tunes with that trio, you know. Yeah. Um, 
And then when we started touring, it, it got a little weird. I didn't want to bring it on the road. On the record, it's only on one song. It's on, on one song on that electric Miami trio album. It's, it's actually on Someday My Prince. That's, that's this guitar. Yeah. Uh, but it wasn't, it wasn't like my, my, you know, my, my right arm yet. It wasn't like a part of me, you know, like the strap right. was at that point. Yeah. Yeah. But it's crazy how, you know, you went back and did, you know, this whole like intense period again, and you came out the other end, you know, obviously with a new voice, but even more of like, I think an original voice, like now you, you have this thing that's such a blend of the history and then all that other stuff, you know, the fusion and the compositional love that you, you, you have and knowledge. And yeah, I think that's what makes you sound like nobody else. I mean, it's, you know, you have such a personal voice. Well, thank you, man. That, that's, that's when I hear that, it makes me feel great because that's kind of the most important thing for me. You know what I mean? Like, I know I'll never be the fastest guitar player in the world, you know what I mean? And, and I, and, uh, you know, I might not sell the most amount of records, but if people say, oh man, he really worked hard and developed his own thing. That's kind of, that's all I care about, you know? Yeah. It's like my main, my main thing. I, and that's the thing about my favorite musicians that pull me in is people that, I like people that create their own universe with, with the music, you know? Where yeah. it's like, you almost don't judge it compared to other things because it's just its own thing, you know? And, and I, I love that, you know? I was, for me as a kid, that was one of the most amazing things to realize every record my dad would put on, even if they'd be playing similar tunes, similar changes, similar vibes, everybody sounded like a completely like, like this is, this is its own thing. Like even Albert King, BB King, you know, Freddie King, they were like, they were all so different to me, yeah. you know, yet they're sometimes playing the same song, certainly the same changes, you know what I mean? And feels, and it was like, no, these guys are all in another world. Like, and I, it was, yeah, that's, so I always felt that, like push to like, you got to find something like that. You got to, you got to figure out a way to do something that's yours, you know? Yeah. I mean, in blues, it's even more amazing because it's like, it's, it's so much more of a narrower area that you're dealing with. And if these guys create their own universe in that area, it's amazing. It's like, they're all playing 12 bar blues. <laughs> it's like, yeah. It, it, it is pretty incredible. Actually. You, when you listen to how different all these guys sound totally. and that's, a frustrating thing about blues today is now you end up with guys who feel like their only job is to be, you know, a museum <laughs> restoration of, of this stuff. And they're not It's like, well, dude, all these heroes that you idolize, that's not what they were doing. They were doing their shit the best they could, something new. And it's like, yeah. you're just preserving, you know, and I know that's a, in jazz, same thing. I mean, you got those bebop, you know, the guys who won't move past it or, you know, but, and it's important that we keep it going, but come on, you know, no, no, it's it's got it, it. It's almost like the the it's like it's ironic or paradoxical, I guess, the, that it seems like almost like the more information there is, the more everything starts to sound the same, and that's a, a real <laughs> danger, you know, because it should be the opposite, but it it doesn't work out that way, you know. It it never works out that way, man. Yeah. And I, I just always go back to thinking, you know, BB King was yeah, he loved T Bone Walker and Charlie Christian and Django, but he wasn't trying to sound like those guys, even though those were his three favorite guitar players. It was like, he, Interesting. I didn't you know, know that. yeah, those are, so those are BB's favorite guys, Charlie Christian wow. and T-Bone Walker, a guy named Lonnie Johnson too, and Django. He was a big Django fan, but he sounds nothing like any of those guys, you know? And he, he was just trying to do the best he could like, and, and that's all they did. And that's why, like, when I see guys come in, like, the one that gets me is, Guys now will play, you know, like Johnny Guitar Watson with the capo, and they'll be out of tune on purpose so they sound just like that. That stuff drives me insane, you know? That's hilarious. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> missing the Dude, point. Let's... Hashtag missing the point. Missing the – yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, they didn't care anything about, like, were they getting the their hero shit right. I, that wasn't right. even a thought that they crossed their mind, I don't think, ever. Any of them. No, that's, yeah. I mean, that's the big thing I teach, you know, I mean, I'm doing this explorations of note thing is my main activity these days, and it's been great. And that's the, 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 the thread that runs through the whole thing is get inside the master's head. That's what you want to do. You don't, you don't want to mimic it. I mean, you can do that. That's a stage. But the whole idea is the end game is to figure out how they think. 
And then once you figure out how they think, then you can take that and build your own thing. That That's what it's about. It's not about, yeah, like you said, like, you know, tuning it the same, buying the same gear, you know, mimicking the, the, every solo. You know, you if you just leave it at that, you've, you've missed the point. You got to, like, get in there. Yeah. Why did they do this? Why? What were they thinking of when they did this? How can I take that and apply that to my concept, you know? Yep. Yeah. Then you can really draw on the essence of something without copying it, you know? Totally. That's the vibe. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, let's uh let's jump into the ten questions. Okay. I'll All right. Know. I promise they're not they're yeah, not hard. Should I get a drink before these? You you can if you want, but <laughs> I promise. It's a, it's a little early for that. <laughs> uh number one. When you started learning and playing, what was the first thing that when you figured it out? You were like, you couldn't believe you got this. Like, you're so proud of yourself. And it, like, you know, it sets the hook. Like, oh my God, I can't believe I just figured this out. It just feels like magic, you know? Oh, yeah. Oh, man. There's so many of those. It's, it, that would be hard for me to pick one. Yeah. I feel like that happens. You remember. At every stage. Well, I mean, the, you know, like the first one was, was probably that Crossroads solo, you know? Yeah. Remember that? And then the next one was probably Eruption when I figured out Eruption, you know? uh and then later there's some jazz more jazz specific stuff for sure yeah. how did you figure out eruption because i mean you probably didn't see any video of it right yeah i mean i, I think what i did was i think someone showed me some of it and then i start got like i like someone showed me how to tap you know what i mean and yeah, you know what? Now that I'm thinking, I'm, I'm trying to remember if there was tablature with that one that might have helped me because it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, that wouldn't be beyond me. I may, I may have had some help on that. I don't remember. I think it was like part by ear, part someone showing me, and then part, I think, I think I didn't finish it till I checked this tablature thing. Gotcha. That kind of thing. Because it's funny, people don't realize without YouTube and all that, it was like you, you had no way oh, of yeah, like, no, it was, do it. It was like deciphering. <laughs> Stuff. Well, yeah. I was I interviewed Andy Timmons a couple of weeks ago and he was talking about when that came out. It took like 8 months before he even saw any video of Eddie playing, you know, after he had seen the heard oh, the yeah. first record. And yeah, he saw a was, picture I, Yeah, those guys were, you know, kids when it first came out. For me it was you, you, you know, probably Yeah, no, he was so he says he remembers uh in guitar player the first time Eddie was in the magazine there was that picture of him as a famous, but he's like this with his hand and he's, and he's just playing, you know, to, and Andy assumed that was how he played eruption. So that's the way he learned eruption was like this. And wow. that's the way he still plays it because that's the only way he learned to play it. Wow. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I think for me, it was like uh, that one, that one I learned like in pieces, you know, but so it was probably like one part that I learned and I said, whoa, right. and then that, then I, well, and then I'd start, it was probably over a course of two years that I put it together, you know? Um, yeah. Also, I remember that with like, like I had a friend, we used to play the attitude song, that vibe thing. We used to play oh, yeah. stereo, like in yeah. stereo, he would do the, you know, he would do one because there's like a lot of harmonies and we would, we, uh -huh. we got that together. That was fun. Um, wow. Yeah. There's a lot of that, a lot of that stuff. I, I always, give credit for getting my chops together i mean because it was just you know that was a golden age of chops guitar chops you know it, <laughs> yes it was yeah <laughs> there was so many you know the shrapnel and guitar for the practicing musician and oh, all that stuff yeah, well, yeah i was i was in that thing when i was 16 i was in the guitar guitar player spotlight it's, yeah yeah, absolutely. yeah 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 the crazy stuff man uh, uh, well my then middle, my middle name because i thought no one would remember my last name so it's, it's, it's under John Evan. And really? I, yeah, yeah. And I still remember because I took it home and I said, Dad, I'm in this magazine. Check this out. And my dad looked at me and was like, John Evan. Ah, interesting. You know, like, <laughs> it was, I, my heart broke. You know, I was like, oh, man, forget it. I'm going to go back to Christchurch. <laughs> what did you send in? Uh, it was, yeah, it was like a... Uh, trying to remember now i used to play with this bass player named brad russell down there who kind of like heard me in a guitar store and kind of took me under his wing he was an older and great really great bass player and, and he just i think we used his four track and we just had these tunes um 
one of his, maybe one of mine, and we'd like, you know, uh, so it was like, you know, remember the Tascam four track days, you oh, know, yeah. that kind of thing. And man, I'd love to find those. I'll send them to you if I can find them. They're, yeah. they're definitely, got them. they're definitely on that tip, you know, like that Steve Vai kind of, you know, um, yeah. smart, smart rock kind of thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Well, I think you probably answered number two, which was what's the first solo you learned note for note was it crossroads, I guess. Uh, yeah. The first one in crossroads. Um, yeah, definitely. There was, there was, a, it was like a, you know, there's definitely formative lines. I remember though, like, especially in jazz, there's a lot that I remember. Like there's like the, the, the beginning of uh, bird on just friends. Right? Of you hear that and just like how the hell you know i mean that's like perfect so i thought man he must have he must have written that like that must be and, and then of course i found the alternate takes and and they're all completely different all I mean, yeah all completely different that was yeah. man I, I remember that thought too as a kid, not on that song in particular, but I, hearing some something like that and thinking, oh, what a long thing he wrote, you know, this piece, and, and someone telling me, no, that's he didn't write that, you know, it's right. like, yeah, and I, yeah. I couldn't wrap my head around it as a kid, yeah. He's a genius. I mean, he just thought so quick. I mean, that's so so fast and perfectly ordered. If you analyze that, the chord tones is like it's they're perfect. It's like Bach, you know. Um, yeah, it's insane. Oh, all right. Number three, what's the first thing you play every time you pick up a guitar? Your hands just go somewhere on autopilot? <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Because my drummer busts me out. Like, he, know, he knows it so well that he'll, like, you know, he'll, he'll finish it with me, you know? Yeah, because yeah. it's like my sound check line, basically, I call it. You know, it's like, it's yeah. it's, uh, I'll, I'll, usually I'll play a guitar, you know? see what it sounds like and then I'll go and then Colin always hits the symbol with me <laughs> that's it, funny to me yeah. because I had one that I played every time I would hit standby on the amp and sound yeah. check I'd play the same thing so much so that both the drummer and bass player would be parroting it back to me all the time I had to change it it's the sa yeah the same thing now he just waits for it <laughs> Sometimes I'll even mess with them and like wait, you know, to hit it. But yeah, yeah, it's good, it's good stuff. That's funny, man. What about if you're in a guitar store? Do you have a little thing you do to check a guitar and let you know if you dig it or if it has it? Like something that, that you play that that immediately tells you if you like this guitar or not. I think it would be the same. It's the same, same. thing. Yeah. That's the sound yeah. check. The sound check line. The yeah. sound check line. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, it sounds silly, but it is like you, you you flip standby on the amp for the first time in that room. You want to know with a control, right? what does this room that's, sound like? That's yeah. exactly what it is. I mean, I never thought about it. I just did it, but that's what it is. is you want to hear something that you know, like, does this feel like home? Or does this feel like I'm on another planet when I play this? You know what I mean? That kind of thing. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Cool. All right. Number four. What? key style song groove whatever do you have like running in your head as a narration if you're driving around or cooking breakfast or something do you have something that just always pops in there mine's a shuffle in b flat and normally some sort of swinging maybe charlie parker type thing going through it but that's just what i hear 24 hours a day is do -do 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 -do. never goes away and it's always in b flat what about you you got anything that just always shows up <laughs> I don't, I don't think so. I mean, I, I do hear like, bah, like if, if I pick up like a guitar, I can hear C and I'll use that to, you know, sometimes get in the right zone or whatever. But as far as mm. like hearing in my head all the time, nah, I think maybe that's the, the jazz head. I'm always changing it. It's always something mm. else. You know what I mean? I don't think, I do get obsessed with melodies for sure. So I don't want you to think that that doesn't happen. But it gets like I was working on a tune collaboration with a buddy yesterday. And yeah, I went to sleep just over and over hearing this melody in my head and I woke up and there it was again. You know what I mean? So it, it yeah, definitely happens. But I don't think it's like a so you, you're hearing that like just forever, like every day. 
every day when I take a walk, when I'm driving the car, when I'm cooking eggs, I'm just it's, there's also, always of course like bordering on a curse though. It's like that's it's good, but it's also like a little like why will you you know? Dude, when change I lay down, tea. when I put change tea. yeah, when I put my head down, it's like I have to finish the solo before I can fall asleep. You know wow. what I mean? Yeah. Well, that's it's beautiful too. I mean. Maybe I'll get one after this. I don't know. <laughs> well, as an addendum to that question, do you do you ever like pay attention to what the first thing you hear is when when a piece of music comes on that you're not familiar with? I've been trying to to focus in on that lately. Like, if something comes on and I've never heard it, where do I go immediately? Is it am I improving over the top of this? Am I, you know, just maybe harmonizing the melody am i paying attention just to the groove the groove the drums or something and it's weird i'm always just immediately improving and i guess that's because what we right. do you know but i'm wondering right. do you ever pay attention to that that's a good question uh i think that would maybe depend on the style of music if it was you know what i mean yeah. i'm definitely depends on my state too mm. you know if i'm if I'm in kind of a compositional mode, it's probably going to be analyzing everything intervallically and, you know, yeah. you know, the harmony. If I'm, you know, if I'm drinking, it might be a little more like the colors, man. Let's just get into this, you know, <laughs> you know the vibe, the vibe, you know. And, and whereas, yeah, if, I think it's just going to depend on the situation. But, it's yeah, definitely. And if it's a soloist that's really good, I mean, I'm probably just going to be transfixed and really, like, whoa what's this cat doing you know what i mean sure yeah yeah it's weird for when i was the first 10 years out here in la when i was really doing a lot of sessions it changed the way i listened to music which it's kind of gone away now but it, for for that period it was like i could only listen to anything and think okay what what what, what should be my part like what would i add into here if i was on the session ah, you know yeah, what i mean that makes a lot of sense actually and that's the yeah. that's that's obviously the, the uh the most valuable asset for a session cat is to hear something and hear right away. Okay. This is, this needs this. Yeah. Dude, that was, that was weird. I mean, how many, I don't know how many sessions you've done like on, you know, outside of your wheelhouse music over the years. Cause that, when I moved here, I'd never done any, you know what I mean? That was, I was the opposite. I did tons in Miami. Right. Uh, and I always say that that's the thing about Miami is like, you can, you can play five nights of gigs and they're all different music. Yeah. And then you move to New York and suddenly there's like 5,000 of the best bebop guys in the world. There's like 5,000 of the best funk guys in the world and they're all there to do one thing. Mm -hmm. So it makes you kind of choose, what am I here for? You know what I mean? And I miss sure, that sometimes sure. about Miami. I'm glad I had it in my formative years, you know, but uh, yeah. Yeah. Mine was yeah. backwards for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I could see. I could see. Yeah, you're right. Because you were playing like strict blues in Miami and then you moved to L.A. and suddenly you're doing all kinds of different stuff. Yeah, and it yeah. took like I had no idea when I would get on a session. They put a chart down. I'd play the chords that were on the chart and be like, I nailed it. I'm out of here. You know what I mean? Right. Not realizing I had to like make up some real parts, you know? Right, was, right. Like, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now you got to do this. We need some chicken picking here. We need some, some swells here. We need some. Yeah. Yeah. Like, exactly. what do you mean that's swell? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was, it was a, a, a rude awakening because I met Landau and he was the best I'd ever seen. I went, I tagged along with him to a session. Great, great, great session. It, well, yeah, I tagged along and, and it was like, oh, okay. So this is what I have to do. Shit. I got to do some work. <laughs> you know, like, All right. yeah. yeah, crazy. All right. Number five, when did you feel like you maybe started to find your voice as a soloist like did, do you remember a moment where something clicked and you felt like i should go further this way this kind of feels like like me a little bit yeah i mean i think probably i had multiple again like you know eureka moments you know along the way you know i remember i remember one let's see that must have been like yeah when i was probably like 17 or something doing some gig with with a, a group I had put together to do kind of this fusion thing somewhere in Kendall or something. And I okay. just remember, yeah, I did something and I just immediately said like, Oh, okay. That's something that's, that's its own thing. You know what I mean? And, and, and kind of getting, you get bolstered when that happens, you know, it's like something happens that gives you some fuel, you know? And then I remember almost like on the other tip, 
I had another great Eureka moment. I, this is a good story, so I'll just tell. I mean, you know, I was playing, uh, you know, this, which is, uh, you know, that Matheny tune, Have You Heard, and was playing with the UM CJB. They had these great arrangements on Matheny tunes. He had come and done a mm -hmm. concert. So Makes I was, sense. Yeah, yeah, that would have been like a couple of years before. So I, so I was psyched. This was my chance to like really do my Matheny stuff. You know, I had my 175 and I had all my stuff down. And I was ready to nail my Matheny stuff. And building up to the solo as that bridge, dee dee da la da da dee dee dee, going, re getting ready to go on the solo. And I look in the front row and there's the hair and the big <laughs> smile. And I said, what the, what the hell? <laughs> Pat Matheny in the front row. And I, and I said, it was like a eureka moment, you know, like you cannot play Pat Metheny's stuff to Pat Metheny, you know, that's just going to sound, you know, like, you know, it's going to hurt his ears, you know what I mean? <laughs> and it was, just, it was like, it's like, it's not respectful, you know what I mean? Like I, it hit me at that moment, like this, you know, you're playing his tune, you know, be yourself on the tune, you know, and, and everything I had prepared for went out the window and I just improvised, you know, and uh it was great you know i mean yeah. I, I think i sucked don't get me wrong and after i was like apologizing profusely to him he said oh you sound great man and then years later he remembered me which was like a really big wow. thing for me you know at that age it was crazy um so you know i think that it was just a huge lesson and i went home and actually I, you know it's like it's like moving away from home i had all my pat albums in a bag and i remember tossing him in the top of the closet, like, that's it. You can't listen to him for a while, you know what I mean? It was hard, but it was it was a, a good thing. It helped me find my own sound, you know? Oh, yeah. I, I, I mean, I can imagine looking out there and be, yeah, you're going to play all that stuff. And then, of course, you the second you see him, you got to change up midstream. But it's like, I, I remember as a kid, you know, I was so obsessed with Stevie. Yeah, I was going to ask, was, did you ever have to play in front of Stevie? Well, no, I, you know, I was too young, so he passed away when I was ten. So it was like that. Oh, was, I would. I don't think I realized that, man. I always forget how early it was because I saw him. I saw him and really? Beck. Yeah, I saw that concert with him and Jeff Beck where they did that tour. But I, wow. I didn't realize you'd be that young at that point. Yeah, because I was probably sixteen or something, right? So yeah, that that would make sense. Yeah. No, so no, I never had to play like in front of him. It would have been exactly it, the same thing. You would have the same thing. You would have been like, okay, now what do I do? <laughs> yeah, well, it was funny. This year, I've known Eric Johnson a long time, but we never played together, and I played with him this year. And wow. even that was like, I better not play any of his licks right now. You know what I mean? Like, was, yeah, yeah, yeah. Was... totally, totally, man. Yeah. And, and yeah, and Pat for me was probably like Stevie for you. It was like at that age. It was just all encompassing, you know. It was like that was, yeah, you know, chasing the sound, and then to suddenly have that person there is like a whole other thing. Yep. And then, kind of once, it's weird when you have that watershed moment. Like you said, you put your records away. For me, it was seeing other older men playing like Stevie Ray Vaughan, and and realizing this ain't a good look. Like I need to get my own shit together. And, yeah. and then, and then like overnight, like I'm not doing that anymore. Like I'm, yeah. I'm going whatever left turn I can make. I'm taking that left turn right now. Yeah. Right yeah now. Same here. Yeah. Same here. Yeah. It's yeah. a good turn. Yeah, yeah exactly. But, it, but it's, but it's, it's a better turn when it happens after you did what we did, when you really get into a player and understand them, you know? Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, number six, man. What do you consider your biggest weakness on the guitar? Can I say booze and crazy women? <laughs> yeah, I guess. <laughs> I mean, that's probably that's probably the two things that 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 made me a worse guitar player. But um, <laughs> um, no, no, I, I'm I'm kidding. But uh, weakness. I mean, I, I'd say just, you know, the challenge, which is a weakness, I guess, if you succumb to it, is just always trying to find those balances, you know, between those opposing forces, you know, like to me, like searching for new sounds, going to the past and realizing how, what a wealth of tradition you're going to ignore if you think just about the future, you know, mm. that's, there's been times when I did one or the other too much and then maybe lost control of one or the other, you know, playing 
uh, especially as jazz musicians, playing intellectual ideas, but not hearing them. You know, Ooh, okay. You know yeah. that's that's another balancing act. That to me, it's like two separate timelines. That if one of them gets too far ahead, you start to suffer. You know, um, and that's you know that's always been a, a challenge. Uh, that's a weird thing. That's a jazz thing for sure. It's like, I guess yeah. we all knew kind of being in the audience and seeing a guy who, you know, while maybe is playing some incredibly complicated and amazing shit. You could tell he's just thinking about it every second. Like, how do I shoehorn all of this incredibly amazing shit into this thing, you know, as opposed to just playing music, I guess. Yeah, no, 100%. And that's the thing that, like, you know, I, I say it to my students and then I remind myself every once in a while, you know. It's like, yeah. you know, if you're going to play some crazy intervallic stuff, you have to sing it too. You know, you have to hear it. And, and of course, you know, you want to play some things that you don't hear every once in a while on the edges. It's good to, 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 to uh, you know, I don't believe hundred percent that you should just, all right, I got this language. I'm just, I, I can hear how everything sounds when I employ it, that I'm in control. This is what I want to do. That can be boring. You know what I mean? And, and also not just for you, but the audience, you know? So yeah. you want to find this thing where you're challenging what you hear by adding new material and ideas and sounds but if it overtakes then suddenly you've lost control of of telling a story you know what i mean and it's and it's just yeah. noise you know so it's like how do you do this you know i, I just try and see it like this every time this grows okay now i got to hear that and then this says oh yeah well, what about this okay now i got to hear that you know and this is kind of happening you know yeah that makes sense that's my i think most of my favorite modern you know, modern ideas are guys that think that way, you know, if it starts to get too Schoenberg and like just intellectual, you know what I mean? Uh, or, or even too guitar noodly, you know, there's a lot of that going on right now. Guys with incredible chops, the fingers are yeah. moving and they're playing like things. And so well, that sounds fancy, but I can usually tell when they're not hearing it, when it's, when it's, uh, you know, just the fingers doing the talking, you know? Yeah. Yeah, you're right. I mean, that's the main, are they hearing it or not? That's definitely the main thing. It's like, did yeah. you really hear that before you played it? Are you just showing off, you know, like some idea? Right, you know? right, right. Yeah. 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 And we all can tell the difference when you hear the real thing or you don't, you know? Yeah. And when you hear someone who's really in control yeah. and can hear everything, but then they're really pushing themselves to try and hear something new. That's so exciting. You know, when yep. you know that someone is someone who really can, like when Train would do that, you know, yeah. he had so much command, and then he would really push to the edge where he was losing it a little bit, and he was maybe trying things that he didn't hear yet. That's mm -hmm. exciting. You know what I mean? Yep. Yep. And it, and especially like the non-guitar playing audience members, they really can hear it. Like if you're just playing a bunch of stuff that doesn't oh, relate and you don't hear it, they're not even going to, they're just not going to enjoy yeah. it. No yeah. way. They're the first to know. That's the irony about it, huh? Yeah. Know, yeah, they're the first, absolutely the first to know. Uh, all right, number seven. Who's a huge influence on your guitar playing that maybe people would be surprised to hear? Oh, that's a good one. Uh, it doesn't have to be a guitar player. I mean, it could be like anything. No, it could be anything, yeah. Actually, he plays guitar, too. I would say, you know, and this is a guy I heard back when I was in, in Miami. Um, a friend of mine said, he calls me up, and he says, man, you got to come down to Stephen's talk house. you got to hear this guy. He's like, he sounds like a cross between, uh, what did he say? He said, it sounds like a cross between Robert Plant and Billy Holiday. And I was like, what? And, and I, as I, I, you know, I zipped over there. It was Jeff Buckley. Jeff Buckley. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, that seeing that show and then subsequently getting into Grace, the album Grace, I think I think that was a huge influence on me, and not not you know directly even jazz oriented or, or you know connected to kind of literally what I do, but just the way he expressed himself, created his own universe, could play with dynamics, you know, was a great guitar player but a, an incredible singer, you know what I mean. Uh, uh, just a really complete musician. I mean, he's really lost him too young. You know, it's so oh, sad. Yeah. You know? yeah. But yeah, no, I think he's he was a big, a, a really big influence. You know, it, it kind of, 
bolstered my idea of, of the, the, the creating a vibe with the music. You know what I mean? Like a heaviness mm -hmm. with the music. I think you really did that well. Wow. Yeah, that's kind of random, but yeah. I he I hear it though, and I mean, obviously, such an incredible talent, and that record is just completely yeah. insane. Yeah. I mean, my version of Hallelujah is a direct tip of the hat to him. You know, it's trying trying to play his guitar and his voice on on the guitar it wasn't easy, but yeah. Yeah, amazing. Well, that's a good answer. All right. Uh, number eight. Would you rather have a good guitar and a shitty amp or vice versa? A crap guitar and a good amp on a gig situation. Good guitar, shitty amp, or shitty guitar, good amp. Yep. I think with either of those, I'd probably be hiding in a broom closet somewhere, you know. Uh, <laughs> it's tough, I mean, both for sure, but I know we can't say that. Um, I mean, the problem is this guitar, I'm so connected to this guitar that if I have to use another guitar, it's usually like kind of freaky. You know, I have done it before, mm -hmm. but, but uh, I'll spend time really finding a guitar that'll work. You know what I mean? Oh, that's tough, man. But a bad amp is really rough. I know. And what's funny is we spend so much time flying into gigs, playing bad amps all the time. And I mean, I've become kind of, I'm kind of a bitch about it now. I mean, I'm yeah. really like, I make sure there's a Fender Deluxe and there's usually a second amp, a solid state amp, like a Polytone or a JC, mm -hmm. so that I can use that. If it's a, if something wrong with the Deluxe, I can just kind of, you know, I play in stereo and I just favor that one. And I'll, I can always run the, the Deluxe really low and mic it if it's got a bad, you know, tube that's farting out or something, you know. Mm -hmm. So I have tricks. I would probably go with the, the bad amp and the good guitar just because I have a lot yeah. of tricks that I could do at the end of the day. I use monitors sometimes. If, mm -hmm. if, the bad, if the guitar amps are really bad, I'll use monitors, you know. With the bad guitar, I think you just, I just couldn't, I wouldn't be able to make it work. You know, there's nothing I can do, you know. If, yeah. Maybe if I had a couple extra sets of strings and a good two hours to, you know, to tweak it, you know, to pick up heights and the strings and everything, I could maybe make it work. It's tough. I'm going to yeah. go, my answer, I'm going to go with a sh shitty app, good guitar. All right. Fair enough. What fair would you enough. go with? Uh, I'm the other way. I, I, I'd rather have a good amp and whatever guitar. Yeah. Because even with the worst guitar, I know I'll have a better night with like an amp that gives me, that has the headroom I need and gives me something as yeah, opposed to vice you. versa. I mean, I, I've just, I mean, even though you, 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 like you said, you jump into the jazz zone and I jump a little into the, 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 the roots zone a little bit. I think some of that's stylistic. If I was playing, you know, a blues hit, I would definitely go with what you're saying. Because yeah. the nasty old guitar can have a thing, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Whereas, like, I if I play one of my, one of my kind of inversions up high on the neck on a shitty guitar, it's, it's going to be completely yeah. out of tune and whack, you know what I mean? Yeah, you're you you definitely have maybe some more instrument dependent things going on than I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that was been interesting. Those are like some of the guys I've been talking to. The ones who choose the guitar are ones who literally can't do their gig unless they have their guitar. You know, like Charlie yeah. Hunter or Tosin right. Abasi or guys like that. You know, yeah, right. that makes sense. So, yeah, yeah, interesting stuff. Although Tosin said. They, he's done gigs where they've lost the guitars and he's made it work, you know, but it's incredibly difficult. Yeah. Like on a regular six string guitar. No, they found him a seven string, but like a terrible oh. one, you know? Right, yeah. Right, right. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yep. Well, that's why he started his own guitar line. Now, whenever he goes, he'll just go to the store and they'll have his guitar. Hopefully. Exactly. Yeah. He'll be covered. <laughs> oh man. All right. Number nine. What keeps you, pushing forward and, and like learning new shit and getting better. Is it just the love of the instrument? Is it something else? Is it your per personality that never wants you like to rest? Do you worry about that stuff at all? Or is it just second nature that you're always working on new stuff? Yeah. I mean, I think working is the challenge, especially a time like this when we're, there's no gigs. It's like, it's, it would be really easy to just watch movies all the time, and exercise, eat good food and, you know, not play, you know, um, 
So for me, it's a little bit like that. Like I, I have to push myself to pick up the guitar. And then once I pick it up, I never have a problem with having things and having uh, wanting to grow. You know, the problem is picking up the guitar, you know, for me uh, now oh. because of what's happening. Um, well, it's interesting. We're, right we're all now. we're all learning which of our friends, because we all have friends now who have gone 10 months without playing like at all, really, which is wow. weird. Yeah, that's weird. No, no, I mean, I'm also that's why I teach, you know, teach puts the guitar in my hand. And every time I finish a lesson, I'm like, "Ooh, I want to work on that thing. You know what I mean? whatever that thing is I was teaching, you know? So yeah, for me, it's, it's really always been about getting the guitar on my end. I also like, you know, I like life and I like exercising and, you know, I love movies and there's lots of things I like, so I can easily be distracted from picking up the guitar, you know, but when I pick it up, it's, it's usually just takes a few minutes to kind of get bit by something or that, you know, and I can just run with that, you know? Yeah. Do you ever worry about, you know, aging and and playing like and keeping it together maintenance basically is that something no. you think about at all because no. i do <laughs> of course man that's terrifying it is right it's terrifying yeah yeah, yeah. it's terrifying yeah. but you yeah. know i mean i'd say we're we're lucky i mean you know we're doing one of the few things in this world that when we when we go we leave something you know yeah that's 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 the thing that that I never consciously thought about much, but I realize it's always been there. There's been this feeling like, okay, I'm doing something that's going to survive after I'm gone. You know what yeah. I mean? You're right. I don't give that a lot of thought very often, but you're, you're right. It's true. Yeah. And it's big. And, and, I, and, that, and that also, for me, I think is connected with the whole idea of creating something unique. You know, it's mm. like the more unique it is, I feel like in a hundred years, there's a chance there'll be some people listening to it, you know? Yeah, yeah. And not that I do it for that reason, but it's somehow it's, it's like a little bit of a warm blanket, you know? Oh, yeah. That's yeah. a good feeling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. especially if you're doing something good, you know? <laughs> <It's> not, <laughs> these, these cats at Spotify, I don't know how they sleep at night, but, you know. Yeah, no shit. Oh, man. I've been, I've been hit a lot lately by the feeling, you know, maybe it's just the getting older thing, but... You know, I'm realizing now that I'm the age that so many of the guys that I idolized were when I was listening to them now, That's basically. Completely freaky. Or or older. Yeah. Yeah, or older. And then also realizing that as I grew up playing and I heard them when they hit ten more years, fifteen more years, hit fifty five, sixty, that all of a sudden they didn't play like they did anymore. And I and I'm telling myself like fuck. I can't be that. I, I don't. I, I don't only have 15 years left. No way. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I mean, I'm that's... sure they they felt the same things. You know. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's it's tricky. Yeah. No. I mean, and, you know, it's, and, you, and it's interesting how some guys really do keep that fire and that that drive. I mean, yeah. you know, I mean, Holdsworth sounded pretty great until maybe four years before he passed. You know, it was pretty yep. amazing. You know, Matheny's mm -hmm. still burning. You know, Schofield's killing it. So you know. Yeah. These yeah. cats, you know, I think for them also the challenge is just to keep finding new creative horizons. That's 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 a challenge. Um, you know, I, I definitely felt with my last live album, Capturing Spirits, that was my, you know, I felt like almost like I was really happy with that record and I felt like it, it captured, you know, the feeling of the time. And, and I, I feel equally happy with that if that was the last record I made and... <laughs> Also, if that was a signpost, maybe to something changing in the future or something, you know. So, Dude, I feel yeah. that's literally, I mean, that's the last thing I did, too, was put out the live record this year in January. And it was like, I literally wrote the wrote it out, the liner notes and everything, as if, okay, this is like the end of the last 10 years. Like, I got to go a new place oh. after this. Like, yeah, these are I the know. songs from the last five records. This is what I've done for the last 10 years. Like, I, it's over. You know, yeah. And then suddenly Corona came. It's like perfect yeah. timing, right? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> wipe it all clean. Yep. Yeah. We could we can come back with a Klezmer band now after this. It would be yeah. yeah. Everybody would be fine. I'm in. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Number ten. What's your five year plan, man? Is there somewhere you really want to get or is it just 
fly by the seat of my pants, follow my muse, whatever? Or do you have specific goals that you want to accomplish? No, I've, I've never had specific goals. Okay. Yeah, I don't, I don't work well with that. And, I, and I'll say that, like I said, things are changing a little bit. I'm definitely, I can definitely say that education is going to be much more a part of my life going forward. You know, mm. um, I'm enjoying it like I never did before. Um, I used to teach, it was more like a little tiny side thing I would squeeze in every once in a while and kind of let a few of my ideas go out or whatever. And now I'm just like, I feel totally open with everything I've ever worked on. This explorations of note thing has been really rewarding for me. I mean, yeah. the, you know, the, the folks are, I'm, you know, everyone's really happy with the way I'm laying things out and kind of trying to teach in a way that, you know, covering all the little gray areas that I feel like educate jazz education has kind of left you know trying to shine the lights in the corners and, and it's been mm. it's been great i've been enjoying it we'll see my friends are like oh man you're gonna get burnt out you know you're gonna want to get on the road and you know i mean i i miss the road but i don't see getting burned out anytime soon on the teaching thing I'm, it's, it's if anything it's making me a better musician you know really been enjoying it right do you have musical projects that you know you want to do uh yeah, they're more like flirtings right now, like things gotcha. I'm flirting with in my head, you know. Some stuff that are not so – I definitely want to get back to more trio, you know. That's one thing I want to do. Um, I love playing with the quartet, but it's – you know, the trio's got a different a different thing, oh, yeah. you know. Yeah. So, you know, some of that – just my main center thing is just try and become a better musician every day. That's That's, that's my thing, you know. And then let the, 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 the art grow out of that naturally. You know? mm -hmm. That's a good way of looking at it, man. You know, it's like, yeah, if, you, if, you, if you're just trying to be better, the rest kind of just takes care of itself if you just exactly. put in the work. Yeah. Exactly. As opposed to the opposite can happen. If you start thinking about this new grand project, it can be inspiring, but also you can kind of get your eye off the prize a little bit. You know what I mean? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And what what good is making plans in today's world anyways <laughs> uh, well that's nice i think it's i think it's good i think it's you know all all the the uh, suffering and and uh deaths aside you know this this has been ultimately for those of us that that survive this is it's i think it's a good thing you know it's it's just it's just a chance to to to, to think about it, everything and why we're doing it and you know how precious life is and why we're here and all that stuff, you know? Yeah. I, th I think you're right, man. All right. Well, fair enough. We reached the end of the 10 questions, dude, we did it. We made it. Thank you. Um, for the rulers, we're going to do the turn to video in a second, but there will be links to all things, Jonathan Kreisberg. So you should be signing up. Where does one sign up for the explorations of note? Oh, thanks. Yeah, yeah. So, so now I have one of those link trees. So if they just go to jonathancreisberg dot com, yeah. they can order the new album. They can join Explorations of Note. They can just peruse the website. Yeah. Nice. Well, I'll have the links in the description of the video. And, uh, dude, thank you for doing this. Just for taking the time out of your day. Greatly appreciated. Man, it's been great to hang with you, man. We gotta do it Likewise, in person man. after all this. <laughs> yeah, I, I hope we can, man. It's like I'll definitely. I mean, one of the first stops when this is over would be in California for sure. I was meant to come out there, so it's, it's yeah, gotta happen. Yeah, well, dude, that'd be great, man. And uh, all right, rulers, hang on. And if you're not a ruler, please join or at least subscribe to the channel. It would be greatly appreciated. All right, we'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> 